Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Welcome to another great episode of Israel Unplugged. This is Josh Wander from Yushalayim Yira Kodesh, and I'm here with my co-host Rabbi Moshe Lichtman from Beit Shemesh. Yes. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Israel Unplugged is where you get the unadulterated facts of where we're holding in the redemptive process, focusing primarily on the ingathering of the exiles. It's right before the new year, Rosh Hashanah, and I thought it would be apropos to read a very short piece from the book To Dwell in the Palace. It is a dialogue called The Courtroom Scene by Chaim Aronson. The Judge. Welcome. I understand you lived a full Jewish life in the world you just left. Yisrael says, yes, sir. You set aside time for Torah learning? Every day. You were faithful in your business dealings? Perfectly. Did you anticipate salvation? Absolutely. How? I believed every day that the Mashiach would come to an end and gull us and, the bring, and it would bring the Geula. Well, where did you live? I lived in Muncie. Where's that? In New York State. What land is that in? Land? The land of which nation? W well, America. I see. Why didn't you live in the land of Israel? Well, I, I don't know. So many problems there in it and everything. Did you never learn that a full Jewish life is possible only in the land of Israel? Well, I, I learned it theoretically, but so many from people, great Rabbanim and, and everybody, were living in America. I figured it wasn't something we had to do now. Who? Huh? Who were the great rabbis you used as your models for this? Well, there's Rabbi X and Rav Y. Did you ever talk to them about it? About, about why they didn't live in the land of Israel but remained in the land of exile? Well, not really. I guess they had their reasons. Leaders can't just abandon their followers. Well, how many followers do you have? Well, a few. I've given some shiurim, and, and I have some influence on, yes. Well, I was doing a lot of learning and doing a lot of good things and giving a lot of charity, and who knows if I could have done all those things in Eretz Israel. This will be continued right after the break. Always challenging the status quo. Hello, I'm Rod Bryant on Beyond the Matrix here at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. I want to encourage you to listen each week, every Wednesday at the same time, for an amazing show that will challenge you, inform you, and inspire. News, views, and wisdom for the nations here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Don't forget, Beyond the Matrix every week, Wednesday, here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. So we're just continuing now with the courtroom scene dialogue by Chaim Aronson. And we have a dialogue between the judge and Israel. So the judge says, did you consult with a Rav to determine the validity of your calculations? I, I don't remember ever asking one, no. But what could they say to me if they are all over there? You mean like Rav X, leader of thousands of Talmidim? Yes. You tried to learn from his example? Exactly. Did you emulate him in other areas as well? Well, well, yes, sure. Learning, teaching, piety, character, holiness? Well, did you learn as many hours, teach as many students, perfect your character as stringently as he did? Well, of course not. Did you adopt all of his chumras? Hardly. But this kula you embraced without question. Kula? 
exempting yourself from the mitzvah of living in the land of Israel. Israel shrugs. The mitzvah that's equivalent to all the others. Israel is silent. The mitzvah which brings the whole Torah home. Israel bows his head. A piety, sorry, a pity. Others would have followed you, learned from your example. Israel puts his head in his hands. You could have made a difference. Israel lowers his head to his knees. The whole situation in the land of Israel might have been affected. Israel's shoulders begin to shake. The geula might have come by now. Israel is in tears. So that I thought was apropos to Rosh Hashanah, before Rosh Hashanah, before the high holidays, when we discuss uh, coming to the great courtroom and being judged. Uh, there's no question that one of the things we're going to be judged for is the location that we choose to live in. Are we Lichman? Yes. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, I really appreciate your choice of, uh, of a quote, especially from this book, To Dwell in the Palace. Uh, I was telling you, uh, you know, during the break that before I started translating books, it was was one of the only books in English that encouraged Aliyah, and it was like a Bible to me. I would read it over and over again. I'd read it to myself. I'd read it to my students. It is extremely powerful. It is still to this day one of the best books uh, written on the topic. But what's really interesting is that it's written from, and they say it several times in the book, it's written from the Haredi perspective. It's, it's not written from a religious Zionist perspective. It's not saying the ghoul is here. It's not saying all that kind of stuff. You know, it doesn't quote Rav Cook. It doesn't quote Rav Soloveitchik or any other of those types of rabbis. It totally sticks with the party line of the Haredi world. And it shows that all these great Haredi rabbis um, encouraged Aliyah and all these sources, because a lot of the articles are based on sources in the writings of the rabbis going back 2,000 years. And and they, they, they show that this is something that is that is so clear in the Torah that a Jew, a, a, a God-fearing Jew should want to and should strive to, at the very least, strive to live in the land of Israel. And as the, the court scene, you know, showed that it's not like, it's not like it was really, it was even a thought in his mind. It was, it was not even on the radar. It And the problem is that in that world, you ask the vast majority of the Jews living outside the land of Israel, they, they, they won't even know what you're talking about. They won't even, it's like, it's a non-issue. And that's really the sad part of it. Um, and, and there are actually other books that have come out recently. I might have already mentioned it once. I don't remember. A book called Sacred Soil by Rabbi Moshe Wolfson put out by Art Scroll, which also says the same things. It quotes the same sources that I quote, that everyone quotes. You can't deny how central the land of Israel is in Jewish thought. The problem is um, that a lot of these books don't, the Dwelling Palace certainly does, but the other ones, they don't take the final step and you know give the knockout punch and say, and therefore Jews start picking up and start coming to Israel. Um, someone recently sent me uh, – a, a shiur, a, a link to a shiur by a very well-known rabbi in America, and it was all about the importance of live, of, of Eretz, not of living in Eretz, of Eretz Yisrael, the beauty, the kedusha, the holiness of Eretz Yisrael, and I have to tell you, it was a fantastic shiur. It was a fantastic lecture. It was. It was right before it was given right before Tisha B'av, and it was all about, you know, what he should be yearning for, and all these kind of things. And he also never, never took it to the last step and said, "Therefore, Jews, we should start, we should start moving, we should start being in Eretz Yisrael." It was, it was like, therefore, you know, when you go visit Israel, you should really take in the kedusha, take in the the holiness, and have it have an effect on you, and really yearn for it, like. No, the answer is not that. The answer is pick up and move as soon as you can, or at least, at least 
if it's hard for you because your parent because you're already an older couple and and you're established, at least encourage your children to make aliyah. Make sure that you are the end of the line, that you are the last generation that's going to be living in the lands of exile in your line and your family and say to all of your children, listen, you know, we're stuck here, but you know, we want to, we want to follow you. You go and make Aliyah. We will, we will follow you. We will retire in Israel and be with you when you, when you come, when you go for your year in Israel, when you go to study, stay, there's no reason for you to come back. This is not where we belong. We belong in, in the land of Israel. I think when the uh, when the doing that dialogue when this uh, fictional character Yisrael says that theoretically he learned that uh, Israel's the place to be, I think that really hits it hits it on the nail. Uh, I think the idea is that in in America many Jews are are raised with this theoretical idea of Israel, this mythical place called Israel, is the place in, that that eventually we're all going to be and we're supposed to be, but it's not put down into into concrete, you know, pragmatic uh, action. It's not. It's not. People are not told that Israel is not just a theoretical Disneyland, you know, something that's going to happen in in Mashiach's times. But it's actually something that is currently happening right now, and that they can be an active participant in this process. Yes, that is certainly the issue, um, and it all stems from the fact that the Zionist uh, idea started with secular Jews. It was it was begun. It was started by secular Jews, Herzl and Ben Gurion and the like, and. Rightfully so, the rabbis were very, very uh, careful and cautious about it, and were against it because they were they were espousing ideas that were anti-Torah, and that is a hundred percent okay. But it doesn't mean that we should be anti-Eretz Israel. It that that never was true. Some of the greatest Haredi rabbis. Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zunnenfeld and the Chazonish, who were vehemently anti-Zionist, but they were just as strong in their call for Jews to make Aliyah. It's like, what does one have to do with the other? Okay, there's Zionism, we're against Zionism, but, but Eretz Yisrael is not Zionism. Eretz Yisrael is where the Jewish people belong, and, as, and if it's a possibility for a Jew to live here, he should, he should do everything in his power to live here. And over the years, this, this opposition to Zionism has become this, you know, opposition, as if to say, an opposition to, uh, to Israel itself, or at the very least, again, it's hiding the issue. It's it's making the taking the issue off the table. Since there are you know secular Jews there, and the government is run by secular Jews, therefore, and there are some problems there. Okay, therefore, let's not even talk about it. It's not an issue. Well, when Mashiach comes, you know, he'll take care of everything, and we'll all we'll all come, <laughs> as if everyone everyone is just expecting that when Mashiach comes, you know, there's no doubt that you know there'll be plenty of you know, planes available for to pick them all up, and of course, all of their belongings, and bring it, bring them and their belongings to Eretz Yisrael, and that is a very, very uh, questionable, questionable assumption. In fact, uh, it is a very powerful source that I have in my book, A Drop in the Ocean, from a uh, book called Yalkut Ruveni, which quotes. The student, one of the greatest students of the Arizal, Rav Chaim Vital, who this is, takes it takes a while, but I'm just going to really summarize it very quickly. He says basically, when Messiah comes, there are going to be some Jews who are already living in Israel and some Jews in outside of Israel, and they'll be brought to Israel. And when those Jews are brought to Israel, they're going to see that the Jews who were li already living in Israel are going to be on a higher spiritual level. They're going to be able to fly, and they're, they're going to have like wings, and they're going to be able to fly and learn Torah directly from God himself. And they, the Jews who had lived their whole lives outside the land of Israel and were now brought to Israel, are not going to be able to do that. They're not going to have that same capability. And they're going to complain to the Messiah, and they're going to say, why is this so? Why what, aren't we Jews just like them? 
and the Messiah is going to say that it all, the way God works is mida keneged mida, a measure for a measure. Those Jews who came to Israel and were willing to sacrifice their physical, their physical and their material wealth in order to live in Israel and, and, and therefore put an emphasis, more of an emphasis on the spiritual side. So therefore, as a reward, they're going to get spiritual greater spiritual abilities in the next world. But but you, who cared so much about your money and about your materialism, well, okay, you can have all the money in, you, in the world right now, but that's not, gonna, that's not gonna mean anything to anybody. What everyone's gonna wanna do is to fly and to learn Torah from God. So we will pick up right after the break and we're gonna see a beautiful uh, idea from Rav Cook. Shalom, everybody. Making a difference often takes just one moment and one person at a time. I am Orly Benny Davis, your show host on Israel News Talk Radios from Jerusalem with love. You'll be hearing people talking about politics, religion, social issues, and making a better tomorrow. Join me, Orly Benny Davis, for God and Country. From Jerusalem with love. Wednesdays on Israel News Talk Radio. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Did you know this psalm and many others were composed by a Jewish shepherd and musician who later became a king? Would you like to know some of the inner meanings of psalms to help you connect with God and strengthen your soul? An exciting and easy to read book is now available, which will help you do just that. Software for the Soul, Psalms for Everyone, available on Kindle, Audible, and Amazon.com. Software for the Soul. Modesty at the beach? It isn't just about body image. It's about feeling good. Modest swimsuits so we don't get burned by the sun. So we won't get ogled by strangers. So we'll feel free to express ourselves without the need to expose ourselves. Let Marcy Modest help you to cover up what you want, how you want. Made in Israel. Visit MarcyModest.com. That's M-A-R-S-E-A Modest.com. And get a 10% discount on your first purchase. So Rabbi Lichtman, I, I totally followed what you were saying, and, and I agree with it, and I just wanted to add one point, and that is a very interesting one, that even though the original founders of, uh, of modern-day Zionism and the State of Israel were indeed secular and perhaps even sometimes uh, anti-Torah, there are many people that say that it had to be done through them uh, that this whole process came about. We see, first of all, throughout the, the different redemptive processes, uh, that have from the beginning, from the story of Lot and his daughters, and the story of Yehuda and Tamar, uh, this is how Dovra Melech. This is how uh, this is how Mashiach is going to come through this disguised process, where it looks like it's something which is not good, but in the end, it actually turns out to be, uh, and and it's necessary. The Gros speaks about this. The Vilna Gon speaks about this often. That it's necessary to disguise the process. Rev Chaim Zimmerman says in one of his books. A very interesting uh, idea. He says that the 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 state of Israel, the modern state of Israel, had to be created by secular Jews. Why is that? He says that in 1948, when there was a choice, when Ben Gurion had the choice whether or not to go fight a war with all of its Arab neighbors, and 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 the, if you asked anyone, whether it be a a military strategist or a politician. Uh, a leader, a head of state at the time, they would say, Israel has no chance. We don't have weapons. We don't have the manpower. We have no chance to fight a war against our Arab neighbors. If you ask any rabbi at the time whether that, that war is a war that we should fight, they would say halachically, according to Jewish law, it is completely forbidden to fight this war because the chances are that we're going to lose these battles, we're going to lose the war, and therefore we're not allowed to risk our lives. It's called pikuach nefesh. We're not allowed to risk our lives in order to fight a battle which is not winnable. And he says it had to be done through secular Jews that were not going to even ask the halachic question. They're not going to ask whether it was permissible by Jewish law. Otherwise, it would never have come about. So he actually shows that this, this, the, whole, the whole thing, the whole process has to come about in a, in a secretive way, in a way that seems like it's not, uh, not good. But in the end, it turns out to be the good 
true redemptive process. Yes, 100%. Uh, I agree. And uh, yeah, there are plenty of plenty of sources that uh, indicate what you're saying. Uh, sources in Tanakh that we see uh, also. I'm actually right now uh, working on something that's, uh, that, that mentions again this Yeravam ben Yoash, that God saved the Jewish people through this wicked king. And, you know, God does that. And sometimes you're right. It's because the the religious ones are not willing or not capable of uh, taking that drastic step that uh, people who don't know Torah uh, are willing to take. Um, great segue yeah. to, the, to the shofar, which yeah. is supposed to confuse the satan, yes. right? Because it, it, there's an idea of confusing the satan. This is the whole idea that we're talking about. The whole redemptive process is done in a confused way to confuse the satan, and, and we're coming up with the Rosh Hashanah and the shofars, and I know you have something amazing to say about that. Correct. Uh, there is a very powerful piece um, that is actually a, a lecture, a shiur, a jerasha, a homiletic uh, speech that Rabbi Cook gave in 1933, which was only two years before his demise, before his death. And we all know, if you say to anybody, you know, what happened in 1933, so people People who know a little bit about history will say right away, well, that's when Hitler came to power. That was when, you know, Hitler, Yomach uh, came to power. Well, in that very same year, on Rosh Hashanah, in the Churva Synagogue, you know, the, the recently rebuilt Churva Synagogue in the uh, Jewish quarter, Rav Kook gave the following drasha, the following speech. And again, you have to keep in mind that this is right after Hitler had come to power, before anyone knew what he was going to actually do. He might have talked a lot and you know, said very anti-Semitic things and wrote his book, Mein Kampf, already, and we knew what he had wished and hoped to do, but who knew that he was actually going to carry it through? And Rav Cook spoke about the following. He said, you know, in our in our uh, prayers on the high holidays, we speak about the great shofar of redemption, right? We say to God, which we actually say on a regular basis, every, every day we say that three times a day. Please, God, sound the great shofar of our redemption. And it's based on a verse in, in, uh, in the Tanakh. In you know scriptures that says No, I got the wrong pasuk. Sorry. Right, it's right before that. Right on that day, the great shofar will be blown. What does that mean? A great shofar, Rav Cook asks. A great shofar sounds like there's other sized shofarot. There's also a medium sized shofar, and there's also a small shofar. So what does that mean? small chauffeur, a medium, a great chauffeur of redemption. So he says it's parallel to the halachic categories of a chauffeur on Rosh Hashanah. And when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, there are three levels of, of, of permissibility or you know what's better than the other in terms of blowing a chauffeur. The best most preferred way to perform the mitzvah is with a ram's horn, right? Because it reminds us of Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac, and for other reasons. Secondly, if you don't have a ram's horn, then you can certainly use uh, the horn of any other kosher animal that's also acceptable. And then there's a third category. The third category is a chauffeur that comes from a not kosher animal. A kosher, uh, uh, an animal, you know, that's not allowed to be eaten by the Jewish people, or a chauffeur from an animal that was worshipped by by a Gentile as the god. You know, the certain even today in India, I think they worship the, they worship cows, right? So if a, a, a non-Jew would worship an animal, so that animal becomes totally forbidden for a Jew to use. And his chauffeur is also forbidden to use. So those chauffeurs are invalid. However, says Rav Kook, the, the halacha determines that even though you're not allowed to, but if you did, if you didn't ask any questions and you took a, a chauffeur from an unkosher animal and you blew it, you're yotze, meaning you have discharged your obligation, you're perfect, you're okay. Except okay? For After the fact, right? Except After for the cow. The cow's the exception in the halacha. Why? The, it, it, the, cow, 
things that if it's brought back because because it reminds us of Ketamer, uh, the uh, Ketamer, so anything can be used except for a cow. Uh, okay, fine. And then and and even let's say you're out in so nowheresville and there's absolutely no way to get a chauffeur and you happen to get your hands on an unkosher animal co- chauffeur, then even lechatchila, then since you have nothing else, you are allowed to use that chauffeur to discharge your obligation. So Rav Cook says the same way we have this three these three levels in halacha, we also have three levels of the chauffeur of Mashiach. But first he explains what does that mean, a chauffeur of Mashiach? So what do we all think? We all think and we're all waiting for that that powerful sound of a chauffeur that's going to be blown in this world. And we're going to all hear a physical and actual chauffeur blast from Mashiach. Well, I'm not saying that that's not going to happen necessarily, but it's probable that most of these prophecies that are given in in the Nevi'im that are talked about in the prophets are metaphorical. And that's the way Rav Cook understands it. It's a metaphorical thing. What does it mean, a show for redemption? We mean an awakening and an in- impulse that causes the revival and redemption of the Jewish people. It's an inner chauffeur. It's something that we feel. It's something that, you know, that we can't hear actually, but it's something that your mind, your soul hears that is awakening the Jewish people to redemption. And then Rav Cook says that there are three levels of this chauffeur of Mashiach, the chauffeur of redemption. He says, at various times throughout our history, there was an awakening and a desire for redemption that originated in holiness. That means that it's all for the right reasons. We want to be redeemed because we want to serve God better, because we understand that the only way that we could really truly serve Hashem and be and reach our potential as a nation is if we're in the land of Israel and we're not subjugated to the nations of the world. So it's all for religious uh, reasons and for holy reasons. And this, of course, is co- corresponds to the great, excellent chauffeur, a nation's desire to be redeemed because of its lofty aspiration to carry out its grand mission, which cannot be done when the nation is exiled and oppressed. So that's number one. That's the highest level of chauffeur. And as we'll see at the end, that's what we pray for. That's what we pray for on Rosh Hashanah and every single day. Tekabi shofar gadol l'cheiruteinu. Hashem, please let us hear the great chauffeur. Let us want redemption because of the lofty reasons. But, says Rav Cook, at times, this sacred desire deteriorates. Sometimes we don't have that. Sometimes there are Jews and maybe times when that, that desire for redemption is not there. There is, but, but nevertheless, healthy human nature still exists. This healthy human nature creates within the nation a simple, natural desire to become sovereign in its land. It's almost secular. To arise and to go free, to live a simple free life like all the other nations. This natural desire, which stems from normal nationalistic nationalistic feelings, is the ordinary or medium-sized chauffeur, which can be found anywhere. It's good. Ordinary implies that it's something that you know everyone else has too. Everyone, all nations have national feelings. They have national pride. Well, that also could be in the Jewish world. And if that happens, and if that's what causes the Jewish people to be redeemed and to come back to the land of Israel, well, that's also okay. It might not be on the same level as the great, the best chauffeur, but it's a medium-sized, it's a, it's a medium-sized chauffeur. And then, and as we said, this is also kosher. Remember we said that in the second level of the halachic, uh, the chauffeurot of, of, of Rosh Hashanah, that is perfectly okay. So now we're going to go to a break and please stay tuned to find out what the third chauffeur of redemption is. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. This is Shai Bentico, and each week I'll be webcasting to you from Judea, origin of the word Jew, a people besieged and beleaguered in every generation. Nazi Germany's but a memory, but in its place the world invented the phantom Palestinians as this generation's internationally authorized Jew killers. Tune in for a different slant on life in Israel. Phantom Nation, every Monday. Hi, I'm Rabbi David Aaron. The soul basics are the most profound 
most essential and yet often the most neglected in our education. Join me for Soul Talk on Israel's News Talk Radio and discover the secrets to love, spiritual growth, and personal power. How did a nice Jewish girl from Delaware end up living in Israel? Shalom! I'm Natalie Sapinski. Join me on my show, Returning Home. Meet different people who have moved to Israel. Hear their personal stories, their highs, their lows, and everything in between. Each week, we talk to experts on immigration and the process of moving to Israel. Listen to Returning Home every Thursday, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Okay, we are back to Israel Plug. For those of you who were uh, listening, we were in the middle of a very powerful uh, speech that Rav Cook gave in 1933 in the Chukurva Synagogue in the old city of Jerusalem. And he talked about the three levels of the shofar of Mashiach. So we saw the first two are the highest level is when Jews want to return and be redeemed for totally uh, spiritual and lofty reasons to become what we really can, to reach our potential as a holy nation. Um, the second level is the medium-sized chauffeur, the ordinary chauffeur, which is which is the desire to be redeemed for nationalistic reasons, which is ordinary because it's something that we share with the nations of the world. Uh, other nations also have this idea of nationalism and we should be one nation in our own land. Ha- and that's where we left off. However, says Rav Kook, there is a third category of the chauffeur of Mashiach. And it also corresponds to the chauffeur of, of Rosh Hashanah. It is a small, invalid puzzle in Hebrew, invalid chauffeur. And it's only used under duress when there is no kosher shofar to be found. So what does that mean? It means if we don't have the sacred enthusiasm that that the first level of redemption requires, and sometimes we don't even have the second level, which is a desire to live honorably as a nation in our own homeland— when all of that doesn't exist, if it is impossible to blow a kosher shofar for our redemption, then you know what happens? Our enemies come and blow the shofar of redemption in our ears. They force us to hear the sound of the shofar. They shout and make noise in our ears, denying us to rest in the diaspora. Meaning God wants to redeem the Jewish people, but we're not listening. So you know what? He forces us to listen because our enemies start start making so much noise, giving us so much trouble that we have to run away and we have to leave and, and, and we go to Eretz Yisrael where we belong. They force us to hear the, shofar, the sound of the shofar. They shout, we already said that, the shofar of, here, listen what he says, the shofar of an impure animal becomes the shofar of Mashiach. And then he gives examples. Amalek, right? The biblical Amalek who was the greatest uh, enemy of the Jewish people. Petliura. I looked this up. It is some rabid anti-Semite who killed thousands and thousands of Jews in, uh, I think, in um, somewhere in Europe. I don't, I don't remember. Two hundred years ago, Hitler. So here is Rav Cook, 1933, standing in the Churva synagogue and saying, "People like a Malik Petliura and Hitler awaken us to redemption." He who did not listen to the sound of the first chauffeur, and he who did not want to listen to the sound of the second ordinary chauffeur either, well, you know what? He will listen to the sound of the impure, invalid chauffeur. He will listen against his will, right? But as we said, that when it comes to Rosh Hashanah, if someone has no other choice and they and they hear the sound of an unkosher chauffeur, they still discharge their obligation. Meaning, even this type of nationalism, the nationalism that is started by the staff, by the by the Jewish per, Jewish persecution, contains some form of redemption. However, 
the halacha is that you don't make a bracha on it. It's not something that we we look forward to. It's not something we 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 anticipate. Ah, oh, can't wait till our enemies force us out of uh, out of galut, out of exile, into the land of Israel. That's not what we pray for. We pray to Shofar Gadol We want the highest level of redemption. And if we can't have that, at least at least the medium size. And this is so relevant. First of all, again, the fact that Rav Cook said this in 1933, just because of what Hitler had said, he knew that something was going to happen. And that's exactly what the Holocaust was. The Holocaust was the end of the Galut. It was God saying, Galut is over. You don't want to listen to me. I'm trying to tell you in a nice way that you should pick up and move and come to Eretz Yisrael. You don't want to listen to me? Well, you're going to have to listen to me. I'm going to force you to, to listen to me. And and that's exactly what happened in the Holocaust. But unfortunately, we're seeing the same thing today. Things are happening in the United States of America that are, are shocking and it's shocking that Jews are not getting the message. We've, we've gone through this so many times. There has never been an exile that has ended peacefully or good for the Jewish people. They have all ended in tragedy. So why won't the Jews of America understand and wake up? And understand what is going on. Hashem is giving us the message. He's trying his hardest for us to listen to the first, the highest level, the greatest shofar. And if we're not going to listen to that, at least the medium shofar. Don't wait until we have no choice but to listen to the shofar that is based on our the enemies of Israel. Josh, you have anything uh, you want to yeah, add to that? Just, I want to put in a plug because uh, you have written this, uh, you mentioned in, in three of your books, and uh, you, your books can be found on your website, which is Torazion, T-O-R-A-T-Z-I-O-N.com. And uh, I would highly recommend our listeners go there and they check out your books and buy your books and read your books. Because uh, if you like what you're hearing, uh, there's a lot more uh, over there. I also want to mention another website, which is, uh, which is my website, an organization called Bring Them Home. And uh, bringthemhome.org.il. Uh, we have videos, we have uh, podcasts, we have blogs, we have different uh, resources, all having to do with Eretz Israel, having to do with Aliyah, having to do with the Jews returning home. And likewise, we have an inspirational video series. So I would encourage everybody to go to youtube.com slash Israel Torah. And uh, if you'll see a whole series of videos over there, make sure to subscribe and press the bell in order to get notifications when we put up new videos. We actually just put up a new video today of Rabbi Beryl Wine uh, speaking about the importance of Aliyah today, and we have more to come. So I recommend, again, everybody goes to, to youtube.com slash Israel Torah and subscribes to our inspirational video series. One of the books on your website, by the way, is Ema Banim Smecha, Rabbi Teichtal. And I know you have something to say from that great Yes, rest. yes, <laughs> yes. That it was the first book that I translated, and to this day, still the greatest, and nothing comes close. Uh, Rav Yisachar Shlomo Teichtal was a great, great rabbi in Europe, and he was also anti-Zionistic until the Holocaust happened. And during the Holocaust, he went through a metamorphosis, and while running from the Nazis, he wrote this unbelievable book, encouraging Jews to make Aliyah, encouraging Jews to take part in the redemptive process which was started with the Zionist movement. He became a Zionist, a religious Zionist. People want to say that he, you know, he went off the deep end. He did not go off the deep end. He became a religious Zionist. He still kept Torah and mitzvot. He was still a great Gaon, uh, but he just believed now in the Zionist ideal that we have to come back to Eretz Yisrael. And one of the ideas that he talks about throughout the book is that the Holocaust, which he himself was experiencing and unfortunately he himself was killed in, it's unbelievable that the book actually survived and was able to be printed before he was killed. Um, and uh, he talks about how he views the Holocaust that was happening around him and to him as God's way of telling the Jews it's time to leave the Galut. And very similar to what we just heard by Rav Kook, Rav Tachtal has a similar idea that says that also when Jews don't listen, 
when Hashem tries in a nice way to encourage us to come to, to Eretz, back to Eretz Israel, well, he is forced to use the staff. And it's based on a uh, idea that he quotes in the name of Rav Simcha Bunim of Pshischa, one of the great Hasidic rabbis. Um, and I hope I have time to do this. We'll try to be very quick. Uh, it's based on the verse in... Um, in Shira Shirim, draw me, we will run after you. Mashcheni acharecha narutza. And there's a halachic concept of mishicha, that you want to acquire something. Let's say you want to acquire someone's animal. So you have to make the animal walk towards you. So there's two ways to do that. You can either stand behind, you can either call, stand in front of it and call it. And if it comes towards you, you have officially halachically acquired that animal. But let's say the animal is a stubborn mule. And it's not moving. So you go behind it, you take a stick and you smack it. And then it starts running in front of you. And that also is a valid way of acquiring the animal. But obviously the difference between the two is that the first way is, is, is painless for the animal. You just call it and it comes towards you. The second way is painful. And another difference is the first way the animal follows the human. In the, in the, um, in the second way, when you have to hit it, the animal goes in front of the human being and runs away from him. And that says Simcha Bunim Pshischa is what the pasuk, the verse means. Draw me, we will run after you. We were, we are saying to God, draw me, Mashcheni, acquire me through Mishicha, through this way of acquisition called Mishicha. And we ask you, God, to acquire me, to acquire us, the Jewish people, through which which form we will run after you. Meaning, acquire us in the way that you call us. You say, Jews, it's time to come back home. And we just follow you willingly and painlessly to the land of Israel. Because if we don't, then the answer that God is going to give us is that if you don't want to listen, it still has to happen. Because God has a timetable, and the redemption has to happen when he wants it to happen. And if the Jews are not listening, so he's going to take the staff, he's going to go behind us, so to say, and give us a whack, and give us pain and suffering until we understand that we have to run away from Galut, run away from the exile, till to the land of Israel. Same exact idea as Rav Kook. If we don't listen when Hashem calls us nicely, unfortunately, we might have to listen and we might be forced out of Galut in a very painful, uh, painful way. Amazing. I, I want to take this opportunity to wish all of our listeners a Kasiva Vechasima Tova to be written and inscribed in the great book, the Book of Life. Not only the Book of Life, but in Eretz Achaim to come to the Land of Life, which of course is here in Israel. We wish everybody a great, amazing New Year. Yes. Ketiva Vechatima Tova. See you next year. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. Just click the orange button at the top of the IsraelNewsTalkRadio.home page, log in as yourself or an anonymous guest, and join in on the fun. You'll meet other listeners from all over the world who listen to Israel News Talk Radio, and you can make new friends. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. It's the closest you can get to being in the studio with us. We love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel. 
plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.